Welcome to the Plant Grow Reap podcast. Welcome to Plant Grow Reap. My name's Simone and I'm joined here today with James Stephen, who is our Director and Financial Planner of Entry Group Wealth. Thanks. Uh, thanks for having me, Simone. Not a problem. Thank you for making the time. So we're going to jump off today with some wealth frequently asked questions, uh, mainly surrounding financial planning, uh, insurance, aged care, and Centrelink. So we're going to mm -hmm. cover off on quite a few subjects. Okay. There's a bit there. Quite a bit there. <laughs> so we'll start off with uh, just the basics. So we'll start off with um, what is financial planning? Well, what is financial planning? That Financial planning is different things to different people. Mm -hmm. Like everybody's got their own interpretation. Most people, when they think of financial planning, they think of investing. So they think, okay, uh, if I go see a financial plan, I've got to have a lot of money to invest. Um, and part of financial planning would be investment. Um, that is something we do, but it is a component. Um, a lot of the, but when we talk financial planning specifically, we talk about strategic advice. This is where we're looking at helping someone plan for their future. We look, we, we want to find out where they are now, what their goals and objectives are, and then work out how to get them there. So how to, how to achieve those goals and objectives. And to do that, we'll obviously want to understand them themselves because each plan is for that that individual, that couple, that family, rather than just a plan for everyone. So we can't, you know, it's not a cookie cutter thing. It's, yeah, it's everyone's not a one got size their own. All. Yeah, everyone has their own plan, um, and because of the fact that everybody is different, there'll be different stages in their lives. Mm -hmm. um, there'll be different strategies we can utilize. And some strategies uh, are more appropriate for others. You know, if you're closer to retirement, there's there's some really good retirement strategies. You wouldn't want to consider them when you're in your 30s. So, so we definitely want to make sure we tailor the plan. So it is it is specifically about helping people achieve their goals and objectives, and using strategies um, that are available to everyone, legally available strategies to to maximise their probability of achieving their goals. So the sort of things that would come into financial planning under that sort of sphere, separate to the the investments, would be your Centrelink, um, you know, age pension. It would be age care. Um, you know, mum and dad need somewhere to, to go. That we would help with the advice in that. It'd be insurances. It'd be superannuation um, and all the, the, the advice around superannuation, um, advice when superannuation turns into pensions, pension phase where you draw down. Um, it'll involve estate planning, not that we're the lawyers, but we will work with the lawyers to help make sure someone's estate plan is, is appropriate, mm -hmm. um, and works well. You'd look at cash flow, cash flow management, um, which would be, um, you know, your budgeting, debt management, savings plans, all of those sort of things where we not specifically having to invest, but we, we're looking at unpacking someone's entire financial situation, um, and, and and then maybe investment comes into it. There we go. So one of the uh, facets that you mentioned was uh, investment management or wealth management. Mm -hmm. What is investment management? Okay. So when people come to us, there's a couple of ways to go about it. And I always say to them, okay, we, 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 when you want to invest your money, what? how do you ideally like to do it? Are you a property person? Are you a share person? Are you someone that wants to be hands-on Do you want, do you, or do you want someone who's hands-off and just wants to delegate it and make sure it's just done properly for mm. you? So we want to start with that that high level of, of, of the type of person they are. Then when it comes to the investing side, we'll firstly want to do a risk profile. So this is where we look at someone's tolerance towards risk because that matters in the types of investments they invest in. Obviously, if someone's capable of taking a lot more risk there, they might want um, the shares and the property side of things. But if someone's more conservative, they probably like the idea of having some cash around, some um, some government bonds, some um, term deposits that make them feel better. So we'd, we'd want to tailor it to that type of personality. Um, and uh, But once we sort of drill down further, investment management is going to be around helping them select investments, putting together a portfolio of those investments and then helping them manage it on an ongoing basis. Mm -hmm. Now, not we won't do it for everyone because some people want to be want to do it themselves. So we'll then set up a portfolio which is suitable for them to manage themselves mm -hmm. where they don't have to constantly sort of go, oh, what should we do about this or that? It's more of a set and forget. 
Um, but if we're involved, we will um, intervene where needs to be in the portfolio just to keep everything on track. Um, and in, in the portfolios, you're going to have things, as I mentioned, cash, uh, fixed interest, which could be company debt or government debt. It could be um, term deposit, which is a kind of fixed interest. Um, it could be shares, Australian shares, international shares, Australian property, international property, infrastructure, um, commodities like gold. So, so there's a whole range of things that will mm. go in a portfolio, but it all starts with assessing what's what someone wants, what they're comfortable with, yep. um, and what their risk profile is and then, and, and their objectives. And then we build the portfolio from there. Do you find that with the current, um, pool of clients that you have now, do you find that you have more hands-on wanting to be really involved with what their investments are? Do you, or do you find you have more set and forget they want you to do it and they just forget about it kind of clients? Um, well, it does often depend on their interest level. Mm -hmm. So some people are not interested and they don't simply care about it. They just want their money to work yeah, for them. Yeah, they, they just want to come in and make sure everything's okay. So they mm -hmm. come in, we have our meeting. They really just want to make sure they're on track. Yep, everything's okay. Portfolio's going well. You're on track. You're still still going to ha have a comfortable retirement. You're not going to have to worry about running out of money. Great. That's it. They're yep. out. There's other people who, who are very hands-on because they, they've got an interest. And people with an interest – probably do a lot of, lot of um, perhaps they have a small portfolio themselves. They perhaps have done some investing. So they want to they wanna liaise with us a bit and have those conversations about, you know, why this, why that. Mm. So for those type of people, um, you know, we'll spend more time around specifically the portfolio because it's what they want. Mm. Um, and, and um, I mean, it doesn't mean they always um, know exactly – you know, the, the, the right approach, mm -hmm. but those sort of people, cause they're interested, education's easy. So we can educate them. And then over time they become pretty good themselves. Mm -hmm. So when we, we make a recommendation, they understand it straight away while it works for them. And, yeah. um, and sometimes they come and have an idea themselves, which is a pretty good one as well. So okay. we can tweak the portfolio to give it a bit of their flavor, Yeah, you Perfect. know, okay. which, which, which is good because when people have it tailored to their interests, they tend to stick with it more because it's mm. something they like. They have a vested interest. Mm -hmm. Yeah. True. So if I was to go see a financial planner, do you need to have a specific amount of dollars in the bank for it to be worth your while or is it tailorable? Well, back in the day when I first started, it was primarily around specific dollars. Mm -hmm. and, and some financial planners, it is. They have a minimum. And if you don't have the minimum, then that, that's not in their business yeah. model. Um, but there are also a lot of financial planners now who, who really work hard on the strategy side as well. And, uh, for those type of plans, which, which we are, uh, we, we, we can actually do full financial planning without looking after the investments. So we don't need a minimum, mm. uh, because, you know, perhaps they're in a situation where they're, a, they're a bit younger and they have young children, they have, a home loans, they have uh, the insurance needs, they have school, school fees to worry about. Um, they, they, um, you know, have their superannuation funds. That's basically their overall position. Mm. So they don't have a lot of spare money. Yeah. So you have to be able to help people. Um, and we'll do that. That's that, that financial planning is financial. All the financial planning things I spoke about earlier, mm where we just don't specifically look after the investments. The yep. super fund will, but we'll help tailor, we'll, we'll make sure they've got the right investment options in the super fund, mm. but we're not going to specifically look after that money. Yep. So you can help people and you can, it, it's perfectly fine to have, we have a lot of clients who just aren't investing with us because they're not able to at the moment. Mm. Um, but we can help them achieve their goals just as much as people who have the money okay. as well. Awesome. So on the flip side of that, say I do have a lot of cash mm -hmm. in the bank, what should I do with it? Uh, well, okay. So that's <laughs> a, that, that question is, uh, you can go a lot of different ways, but a lot of people, you know, why do they have a lot of cash in the bank? They've often sold an asset or they've inherited some money or they've won Tats Lotto. Um, and people do win Tats Lotto. We do have clients <laughs> at Aintree who have won Tats Lotto. So they have money and I'll often say to all those groups of people, 
especially if they're not used to having money, it's a new thing and now I've got all this money, what should I do? It's often just a good idea to, to put it into a high yielding cash account. So it could be a, a term deposit for a period of time or one of those um, cash management accounts that offer four plus percent. And just just let it sit there for a bit, maybe go away. Um, just just get used to the idea for a little bit, six months or so. Um, and then at that point, maybe you, you, your head's a bit clearer. Mm. You, you're in a, a better position to now look what's next. So I would typically start with that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> because there would be some people who win things and they go crazy. We've all read stories in the paper about yeah. fast lotto winners and, you know, they win all this money and then they spend it all and they back to where they were. Yeah, six weeks later. So yeah. I'm saying calm down, <laughs> put it in the bank, get a reasonable rate of return for for a few months at least and then come in and then we'll we'll work out, you know, who they are, what they're after, you know, what's the most appropriate investment process um, procedure or options for them mm. and then we'll do it in a methodical manner. Mm. Um, and that's kind of our job is, you know, we, we I like to think a lot of what we do for people is behavioural management. You know, with just help them stop making stupid decisions mm. and and help them make good ones, and I think just doing that actually helps a lot. Yeah, I'd agree. You know? with that. Um, yep. So I'd like to think that's a real, real key thing we do in yeah. the investment management side is, you know, help them make good decisions mm. and stop making silly ones. Mm. So part of what you touched on there is kind of surrounding um, implementing a budget, I suppose. Mm. Um, so what should everyone have a budget? What is the best way to budget? How do you start figuring out how to budget your money? Mm, budgeting. Okay. So here's, this is an interesting topic because everybody talks about budgets um, and not many people do it well. Mm. Like it'd be very rare if someone would come in to see us where they've got a budget ready to go and it's well done and they do it all the time. Uh, but, but I will say to people, you have a budget whether you've done one or not. Mm. Your budget is there. It's just might not be a great looking budget, but it's a budget. Mm. Uh, so the thing typically with, with a budget is we really want to know is with the starting point is obviously where, what is all the income sources coming in? So where's, where's the, like what cash flow do you have? Typically for most people, you know, it'll be from their employment mm -hmm. or maybe employment plus business profits, but it'll be that, that'll be their income. And they might have some investments also adding to that pot. Um, so that's normally the easiest one. We can get that information easily. It, the expenses is the hard one because mm. most people don't really know their expenses. Um, so when it comes to budgeting for expenses, often we'll want to look at, you know, where, how are they spending their money? Like for a lot of people it's on credit cards. Mm. So with credit cards, you can download the last, you know, year's transactions, yep. um, and you can then into a spreadsheet. So we can actually just, particularly if they put all of it on the credit card, which is very common. Yeah. Um, so they probably have something like all the credit card, uh, all on the credit card, plus they'll have some um, direct debits, mm -hmm. you know, for loans and um, sort of various uh, Subscriptions. things they've got, like the gym or whatever. It, mm -hmm. It's all there. So, so you can get by a bank download and the credit card download, you get a lot of the spending. Um, and then we, we know what the expenses are. And, and, and we can also sort of, and we can also clarify that and, and sometimes each year is a bit different. So maybe it was a particularly unusual year. So, so that budget, that those expenses might not be quite standard. So we could pull some out. We'll have a fair idea at that point. And then once we know what it is, we'll, we'll, we'll be able to see straight away where there's any savings. Hmm. Cause that's the whole purpose of the budget. We ultimately want to get to the point where we've got some savings in yeah. our budget so we can actually do things with it. Mm. And because if we're in the, you know, the wealth management business, we want to help people build their wealth. Yes. And to build their wealth, they need to be able to save some money to direct into wealth building strategies. Like could be paying down debt, could be investing, could be both, you know, a combo of the two. Either way, we want their net asset position to increase. So if, they, if they've got a surplus, great. Then we want to work with them and say, can we increase this surplus? Because obviously the more you can save, the better. But there's, a, there's obviously a limit to, you know, to how much you can save yes um so we want to get to that sweet spot where they're comfortable and now if they've got that and we've worked that out that's pretty easy if you're saving it's probably easy for those people the people who aren't saving that's a real challenge because if you're not saving what we've got to do is we've got to go through that the budget the expenses part of the budget 
and we got to look for things we can remove. Mm. And typically, you know, the first thing you want to remove is like things that you just don't get any value out of. Mm -hmm. Like there's plenty of people with subscriptions that right now with like all the pay TVs or yeah. gyms or these things here that they're not using. So we can just get rid of them straight off the bat. So we can get rid of them. Then there's other expenses which you can optimize. So we've got a lot of expenses you need. You have to have them. But to optimize just means getting a better deal. Mm. It could be on your phones, your car, your your insurance. Um, it could be on um, things like petrol, you know, with like uh, the little <laughs> saver cards. Yep. Uh, it, it could be any on anything you spend. There, there's always a, a better way to do it, like home loans. You know, mm. we've got Tony in the office um, and he what he does is he reviews all the home loans to see if, if it, they, they're paying – the right rate, mm. you know, and quite often, especially with the rates that have gone up so much, there's people who are paying a good 50 basis points or half a percent more than what they should. Mm. So if you, if you're on, you know, like a million dollar debt, you know, Adds up that's a lot quickly. of money. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, if we can sharpen those type of expenses, mm. plus get rid of other ones, we're making some savings now. Yeah. Um, and then, and the other side of that equation is income. You know, at that point is sometimes once they've done all they can on expenses, then the next job's to increase income. Mm -hmm. um, and that's an, that's an area that um, people can do. They can upskill. They can do some training to, to get better skills. They can, um, you know, change work, you know, get a, like, because they could be in a position they've been there for 10 years and there's this new world out there. They can get more. Mm. Whatever it is, we need to get to that point between all of those pieces to get a savings. And that I'd consider it to be, a good budget. Yeah. Um, and then uh, we work from there. Perfect. So one of the points you mentioned was um, whether or not the budget was in a surplus or whether there was um, debt to pay off. Mm -hmm. If a client does have a lot of debt, what are the best strategies to pay it off? Mm. Okay. So there's a few ways to go about this. Uh, that the, like if there's a lot of debt and it's all over the place, sometimes people, I mean, it's quite actually, it's quite common. People refinance their home loan and then they'll bundle all that debt. They'll pay all that debt off and just increase their home loan debt. Mm -hmm. So now they're paying, instead of paying credit card interest of like 18, 19, 21%, they're paying it at the home loan rate. Mm -hmm. So, so that, that's a, a common way people do it. Now there's other strategies as well that, that you can use if you're not going to go down that path. There is something called the debt snowball strategy, mm -hmm. and then there's a, a, another version of it called the avalanche. I think I've heard of this um, before. Yeah, and and well, people they they're very useful. So the snowball approach is where you you line up all your debts and um, you work out what the minimum repayment on all of them all of them is, and then you find the smallest one, and and so all the other ones you pay the minimum, the mm -hmm. smallest one you pay all of your spare cash onto that to pay it off as fast as possible. Yep. Once the little guy's gone, then you move up to the next one. So all the money you were putting on the small debt, now you're putting on the second smallest mm -hmm. and you build your way up till you pay them all off. The reason why people like that one, even though it might not be the most efficient because the smallest one might not have, the, might be not the highest interest rate. Yes. But it's psychological. Mm. It's, it's the quickest way to get a win. Yep. And I think for most people, that's the way to go because they got themselves in this position probably because they weren't, you know, because the psychologically they weren't managing their money well. You know, mm -hmm. there was some issue there that caused that. So therefore, I think it's much easier for a person in that position to get some wins because if you're trying to pay debt off over years, it feels like a long haul. Mm. Whereas if you can knock something off in two months, you've got it, it's paid off, cut the card up, it's like a, the it's a win. It. I can do yeah. this and then I move up to the next one. The avalanche is the, is basically lining them all up and going down in highest interest rate um, to lowest, mm -hmm. which is the most optimal way to do it. Yeah. But it can, you can be brought unstuck a little bit if, if, if the, the first debt is a long period it's of time, that's a high. lot of money. Yeah. So typically what people will do those is the, the, the smart play there is to, is to try to combine the two. So, you know, in an ideal world, if you could um, you combine them where you're paying the highest ones off first, um, if, if all things being equal, like if you've got two debts kind of similar, you don't just automatically go with a smaller one because mm. there might be one a little bit bigger but a much higher interest rate. So you just flip the order. Yeah. 
So, but we help people with that. We help people with their debt management because that's part of cash, the, our, our overall cash flow management. Mm -hmm. It debts is crucial. So, you know, and you can have, you can create a lot of extra surplus cash by managing that debt properly. Yes. So we do definitely work in that area closely because cash flow management is the heart of a financial plan. Mm. Managing your money, it's literally day to day stuff is, is yep. <laughs> getting that surplus. So we have to work in that space. So mm. we, we quite, we don't, I wouldn't say we necessarily brilliant at it, but it's something that we literally do all the time. So we know how to, how to handle that. Yeah. And how to do it well. So if a client came to you and they had um, a substantial amount of debt and they said, look, I want to um, increase my cash flow and I want to invest. Would you prioritize paying off the debt first or would you prioritize investing some surplus cash? Mm, okay. So it depends on the type of debt because, you know, they talk about good debt and bad debt. Mm -hmm. So bad debt is is that credit card debt. Yes. The debt where there's, you not get, it's not deductible. It's, it's There's no asset against it. So there's no asset growing. So it's it's, it's something that needs to be gotten rid of. So mm -hmm. I would I would definitely prioritize paying that type of debt off because mm -hmm. you wouldn't really want to be investing in the Australian share market and with a long-term average of like nine, ten percent and having a credit card on the other side, which is paying 21%. Yeah. It's kind of like, you're not really going to make you're it You're not there. winning. No. <laughs> but if they've got like a, if their debts are like investment properties or mm -hmm. a share portfolio where they've, where they borrowed some money against the property, they you know, their home to, to fund that, those are good debts and we, we're happy to let them go. Um, so in that case, it, it would, you know, it would come down to what, what what's their risk tolerance? Mm. Would they prefer to reduce their overall debt load? Just say, look, I'm not really comfortable. I know it's work. It's a good, it's good debt, but I have trouble sleeping at night. They mm. might say, cause it's maybe gotten to, to a reasonable level. Other people will say, well, no, no, we're comfortable with that. Let's grow our asset base. So it c comes back to that original thing I said, where it's, everyone's different. We really, that's why we spend that time at the start with them, just trying to work out what makes them tick and, you know, what they like, don't like, and that way we can tailor it to, to their needs. Mm. What would be the best way to plan for uh, major life events? So events such as uh, buying a house or getting married, having children, they're all very expensive um events mm, they, they, they are. how they do we are. best plan for those well it's a bit like retirement i mean it, it's something you got to do over a long period of time yeah. you can't like just like like retirees can't just sort of like turn up and say like i want to retire yeah um well some of them can because they've got what they ready need but let's say they don't they mm. haven't planned well we can't fix it then so we need a bit of a runway so the ideal scenario is people plan well in advance for these type of things because they are major expenses uh and they're known um, like at milestones in life, people can plan. We we do in all of our financial planning and modelling, we do put these events into our models, mm. and we do plan for you know so you, so people can we have it so that people are funding all of those things well in advance, or at least have a have a, a plan to fund them like over yes. a monthly or annual process. So we know that that they're, they're all built into our plans. But for someone who's just Thinking, listening at the, to this show and thinking, okay, well, how am I going to do it? You, you need to you need to give yourself a significant period of time, mm. firstly, and secondly, what I'd say that when it comes to school fees or like uh, home loans or uh, in, any of those sort of things where or weddings, I'd go and speak to to the in law uh, to the to the parents mm -hmm. because that's a common way these things are funded. So you got to yes. look at what are my funding resources first. Because mm. if, if if it's going to cost say eighty grand, whatever this the education or the wedding or whatever, well, well is someone prepared to help? Yeah, and quite often they are. Mm. Um, you know, and I'll say on the on the other side of the equation, I'll speak to grandparents in our meetings, and I'll always encourage them to to fund these things because there's no point in leaving an inheritance when someone's sixty. Yes, um, the, the, all of, all these problems they've already had to come uh, overcome themselves. It, which which is great on one level, but like it just makes their life harder, and then they get this money when they don't need it. And it's, it can be spent on a holiday, which exactly. would be lovely, but it could so be put towards a home. Help home. them out along the way, and because yep. that way you're more likely to get grandkids. Yeah, if they got more <laughs> money, more support, things mm -hmm. like that, right when they need it. So 
So I'd check. So firstly, I want to know is what what do I, what is it going to cost me? Secondly, who's going to help? And then thirdly, I, I've got to be aware of when I start saving for this event because it's a long time. Right? I'm not doing it for a year. It's like ten years time. Yeah. I need to invest in the appropriate investments mm. because all of these costs go up. Like the ones we're talking about now, they're going up all the time. Weddings, children, yep. houses, Cost retirements. Living. It yep. all goes. These are these are part of that when the, when the government does their CPI basket of goods. These are the ones that go up all the time. You know, there are some that go down, like electronics and TVs and that. Mm-hmm. But these ones, every year they're going up. So. You have to invest in something that's going to go up as well, so you, to to at least keep pace with these increased costs. So that's mm-hmm. where property and shares are going to be an important part of the mix. Yeah. Um, but the reason why it's got to be a long timeline is one, you need to get enough capital into it, and two, when you invest in shares and property, you are investing for ten plus years. Mm. So there's no point in trying to, you know, take a punt and hopefully the share market or the property market delivers in three years mm. because well. If it doesn't. It just might not. Yeah. We have seen GFCs. We have seen tech wrecks. We have had COVID. You know, like things come up, you know. It's not like it's smooth sailing and we can just predict good weather all the way mm. to the next port. It's it doesn't like, work like that. It's almost like um, just assuming you're going to win the TAS lottery, you're going to win the 20 million on the Thursday night or whatever. Exactly. And we know that that doesn't often happen. <laughs> Well, I, I do know people who have won it, but like I said, it's, I know a lot more that haven't. Yes. So moving more so towards uh, the insurance side of things now, I know there are quite a few different types of insurances. Can you run us through those? Okay. So there's two buckets, general insurance worlds out there for mm-hmm. starters. So you've got life insurance and you've got general insurance. Now, general insurance is, is, is insuring things like cars and houses and boats and business premises and all that sort of stuff. So that we don't do that type of insurance. So yep. the type I'm talking about is your life insurance. Mm-hmm. They come under that term life insurance. So there is four specific ones that are, are common in people's portfolios. That would be life insurance itself. So that's where that's that's cover for your for dependents and to pay off debts Mm -hmm. if you pass away. So that's what life insurance is. It's there to fill a hole, um, to replace missed earnings um, that that you would have generated for the family. So life insurance, you pass away, your your dependents get a lump sum and they can then use that lump sum to pay off debt um, and or pay off uh, and or to fund like lifestyle ongoing. Um, so that's what they use that for. Total and permanent disability is a lump sum payment if you are unable to ever work again. So it could be a major car accident. Or admittedly, with car accidents, there is you know TAC and things like that. But it could be a, a crippling um, illness or disability that where you can't work again. Mm-hmm. Um, at that point, you get a lump sum, and that's there to to sort of replace your yeah, future yes. earnings yeah. um, and quite often when we calculate that we'll add debt repayment as well because life always gets easy if you paid off the home loan mm, so yep. we'll factor that in get rid of the home loan plus now a lump sum to live off and uh, then the third one is critical illness critical illness is is payable if someone suffers um up to this this generally these products have about 40 different conditions um, anywhere from cancer, heart attack, stroke to multiple sclerosis, um, motor neuron, um, things like that. Mm-hmm. But realistically, over eighty percent of all claims are going to come from cancer and heart attack or heart-related conditions. Mm-hmm. So those are where they mainly get paid out. So that's a lump sum as well. So the first three I've mentioned: life, TBD, and uh, critical illness are all lump sums. They're, they're, that's someone will get paid out that money. Um, as a lump sum. The last one is income protection, mm-hmm. otherwise also known as salary continuance. Okay. But effectively, it just if you can't work, you're unfit for work um, over, for a specific period of time, then the, uh, the insurance company will almost be your new employer. They'll just pay you your monthly amount um, as long as you're un, unfit for work. Okay. Is there um, any sort of time limit on that? Uh, depends on your policy. So mm-hmm. all of these things are depends on the type of conditions in the policy, but it Typically, it has a benefit period you select. Mm-hmm. So it could be anywhere from two years to age 65, even 70. Okay. So that, but that's something you're going to work out when you, when you set up the policy. Yeah. So you'll know. Um, so if someone's 20, they, 
the possibility is it could be a long time. So they're mm. going to want a long time frame. If somebody's, you know, 62, a two-year benefit might work for them. Yeah. So we'd really want to just assess their current situation. So that's the main types. What are the key things to look for on a super statement? Super statement. Okay. A lot of people, the first thing to do with a super statement is open it. A lot of people <laughs> get super statements, they don't even open it. Straight they don't even in. know who their super fund provider is. Yep. Let's assume you've gotten past that bit and you opened your statement. What you're trying to do is to is to this is this is if this will at least give you an idea of of where you stand in your super. So you want to look at obviously the balance of the super fund, what it's invested in. So it'll tell you what the investment option you're in. So uh, it could be balance is seventy percent of Australians are in the balance fund. So mm -hmm. probably you'd be in that if you haven't done anything. It'll have nominated beneficiaries. So if something if part happens to you and you pass away, it'll say where the money's going to go. Or it might say there's not it might say nothing. Mm. So if you particularly want that to go somewhere, it's important that you address that nominated beneficiary yes, section. Fill in the beneficiary nomination form. Exactly right. Um and then there's insurance. It'll tell you what insurance you've got, mm -hmm. if any. Um, so, so these are all the things that I, I would particularly be looking at what my investment options are, where's the money going to go to, and is there insurance options? And I also look at the transactions. So for the fees, yes. um, cause some super funds are very cost effective, others aren't. Yes. Um, and then I, I suppose to, to, to wrap all that up is returns. You want to make sure that the returns you're getting on your super fund are at least in line with the market. So what, 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 what's expected for that type of risk profile um, and if you can get to all that part, you'll know whether you're super fund, whether everything's okay in there. Most people just assume oh, I've got insurance in my super fund. Mm. Well, it's not always the case. If you haven't contributed for 16 months, the super fund will stop the insurance. Mm. Um, so, or if, if you have multiple super funds and your balance drops below 6,000, they'll also get rid of it. So you really need to open your statement. Yes. You can come into, like if it's, you know, anyone can make an appointment, come to Aintree and we can have a chat and, and we can quickly take you through a statement. I mean, it's very easy, but I think it's the most important thing with planning and of dealing with anyone really, if you want to make progress in your life is to, is to be aware of your situation, yes. like to be aware of the facts. Once you're there, then at least you know where you are now. You can make so, informed you know, decisions. If I want to make changes, I, I've got to know where I am now. Otherwise, exactly. it's not going to work. No. With the super statement, and now that you've opened it and yeah. you, you understand your position, how yeah. do you know if you're on track to retire? Well, some of the super statements actually have in there, like, you know, little indicator. Your, yeah, you're, you're, you're going to be able to achieve X amount in retirement. Okay. I personally think, I, I mean, you, the problem you got with that is you don't specifically know how they calculated that yes. and, and is that actually going to suit you and how much do you really need? Cause you're mm. not the same as the next person. How do they know you specifically? Mm. So I would, I, when, when we deal with people, what we want to do is we want to, um, firstly, we do lifetime cash flow modeling. So we, we will, we'll build a plan for them taking their current resources and showing them how much they're going to have at retirement. Mm -hmm. And working out then, is that appropriate? But we'll also bring in another overlay to say, well, you know, how much do you need in retirement? And there is research that's done and it's updated every quarter and has been for many years. The Australian Superannuation Funds Association has pre prepared something called the retirement standard. And in there, it literally says for a couple who want a comfortable retirement, this is how much you need. It's about 71 grand at the moment. And for a single person, this is a comfortable retirement. And that's per year, the 71? Yeah, yep. exactly. So, um, and they've got a detailed budget behind it. So you okay. can actually go in and say, well, you know, because oh, most people don't much. know how much they need. Exactly yeah. right. But, you know, they've got to they look at that, that budget and they can compare that to where they stand, where they, you know, with their spending. But I will say to them, you've got to remember at this point when you've retired, ideally no debt, no um your kids have been educated um, and it's all spending. You're not saving for any particular thing. Mm. So, so you don't need as much as you, you, you need when you're working because when you're working, you've also got tax. Yes. If you plan things properly and it's all within a superannuation environment, 
you really aren't going to be paying any tax. Mm. I mean, it depends on your balance. If you've got huge balances, that would be an issue. But, you know, that's uh, something we'd discuss with you. But mm. realistically, you're not going to pay a lot of tax. Yep. How do you access your super once you're retired? Accessing super? Well, mm. okay. So once you get to 60, you can access your super if you're um, no longer working. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you are working 65, you can access it without, without any questions. Okay. You can take it as a lump sum at that point, or you can convert it to a retirement income stream, otherwise known as an account-based pension. Mm-hmm. And then what happens is you, you, when you've done that, you will tell the uh, superannuation fund how much you want to take out each fortnight, month, quarter, year, and they will pay that to your bank account automatically. So... On one hand, you can leave it in the super environment, no matter how old you, uh, like all the way to you pass away, you can just leave it in there and take lump sums whenever you want. As long as you met those thresholds of stopping work at 60 or being 65, um, or if, or you turn it into a retirement income stream, which a lot of, most people do. Mm. They say, okay, I need 50 grand a year. And then we turn it on and then they get that money, whatever frequency they want. And then, um, you know, we obviously make sure that the balance is sufficient along the way so mm-hmm. they're not going to run out of money because yes. that's a crucial question we always get is, you know, I, I want to retire comfortably and not worry about running out of money. Mm. So when you say that you can take um, lump sum payments for as much as you like, is there an amount that you need to take each year? There is if you are got a retirement income stream. So if you got that, if you turned the pension on, you have to take out a minimum amount, it's a percentage amount based on your age. Okay. And if you don't take that out, well, that's, that's not, a, that's not a good outcome. <laughs> yeah, you have to take it out. Um, and the superannuation or pension provider will, will make sure you do it. They advise you. They have to. Amount. They yeah. have to do it. So there is a minimum amount. depends on how old you are. So if you're under 65, it's 4%. 65 to 74, it's 5 And then it changes from there. Okay. But you have to, yeah. yeah. But if there's you leave it in super, there's no minimums. You can just leave okay. it in there. In fact, you never have to take a cent out. Okay. So, Interesting. So if you've got most other- Most people don't do that. Yeah. If you've got other income streams, you can just leave exactly it. Exactly right. You can just leave it there and let it compound let it away thing. in a low cost environment. Perfect. And to, to finish up, after we've spoken about um, accessing super, uh, there are some other things that come along with uh, that sort of age demographic. Do we provide help with aged care and Centrelink? Yeah, we do. Uh, we we have uh, the ability to uh, – Centrelink is relatively, for most people, is something that for us is relatively straightforward. Mm-hmm. If they come in, um, they want help with Centrelink, the process, uh, what to do, how to get the, the age pension up and running. Uh, we can even act as their nominated representative. Mm. So we'll have our we'll, – that way we'll be able to access – what Centrelink has on them and upload their details into Centrelink's portal directly so they can avoid having to go in there. Yes. So a lot of retirees mind. like that because they don't like going to Centrelink. They want to set up their age pension and then they just want to make sure that if Centrelink needs anything or any updates have to happen, we can just do that for them. They know we're on top of yeah. it. Yeah. And aged care, what we do is we have a specialist um, company that that gives that that helps us in this area because – there's a lot of lot of different strategies uh, someone can can take when it comes to so going into a home, mm-hmm. financial strategies, and for for each each person's family, it's a different need or or they have a different situation. So, you know, in some cases they want to keep the house, other cases it doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. So what we do is we get all the details from the clients, the family. And then we we send it off to our technical team. So we have a team that is specialist in the aged care area and they come back with a report with like four or five different scenarios. And then then we can help sele- help them select which one's going to work best for them. Yeah. Um, now, they might pr- choose one that's not necessarily the best dollar-wise. It might just be for the family, maybe the second best one. Mm-hmm. But at least they got the facts and they yes. understand what their options are. And I think with, with all the stuff we do, that's what we want to give them is the facts and help people make good decisions. And and this is just another area. And yeah. we, that's why we get the specialist people because it is a complicated area. Yes. And it's not easy to understand. No. Um, so that's that's one thing we definitely are seeing a lot more of now, a lot more people coming to us 
mom, dad's got to go in a home. Mm. What do we do? Yeah. And then we can sit down with them and help them. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you very much for coming in and having a chat today. I'm sure this has been no very uh, informative for, for all of our listeners. Um, and if you do want to get into contact with uh, James at Ancient Group Wealth, please uh, either email us at wealth at ancientgroup.com.au or give us a call on uh, our main line, which is accessible via the website. Um, apart from that, thank you again. I'm sure we'll no have you on again soon. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, we we had a lot to cover there. So We did. So, I, uh, you know... I did. I did speak a lot quicker than I normally do. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, but I felt like well, with time constraints, yes, the more more info we can get in there. Maybe people will listen to this at 0.5 speed. Maybe maybe do the do <laughs> the normal way, speed. I, they got this more one. information, more value, <laughs> um, and so I thought that's the way I'd take go about it. Perfect. Thank you again, and um, for all of the listeners, uh, it would be fantastic for us if you could. Uh, like subscribe uh, onto your on your podcasting app uh, it helps us a lot and uh, we'll be in your ears again next week right thanks thank you